workplace is no longer a place. Where to from here? Nyari Samashonga is the Chief Executive Officer at We Think Code. She is an innovative problem solver and team builder dedicated to lifelong learning and has worked in New York, Zimbabwe and Tanzania. Sarah Rice is the Chief People Officer at Skynamo. In this role, she drives recruitment of the best talent, coaches on team leadership, helps to resolve employee relations issues, and manages programs that help develop staff. Tanim Saeed is the CEO and co-founder of Alsoog.com, a company known for being the first tech startup in Sudan to receive international VC funding in more than 30 years. Ibada Ahmed is a director at Iron Capital. She's a seasoned finance and investment expert with 13 years in the international and African marketplace. Well, our third panel for today is what we're going to deep dive into at the moment. A portrait of the modern worker and the forever evolving hybrid nature of work is what we're quite clear about. Now, whilst the workplace uh, veers from home to office to flexi spaces, it has altered the working lives of those no longer going to work or who are at work. And we are both present and not present at the same time. Now, from the coolers and the corner offices to dirty laundry and working out of kitchen counters or off of kitchen counters, we're going to uh, per per perennially work from home or living from work. Now, through a futurist lens, how are companies readying for what lies ahead? Will offices be the new hubs of innovation? And these are some of the questions and themes that set the tone for our conversation that we'll deep dive into today with all of our panelists, really painting a picture of what the future of the workforce does look like and where to from here. How do we innovate? How do we grow and develop ongoing talent? And of course, making sure that talent in itself continues to evolve, to emerge even stronger, uh, despite the various uh, flexible options that might be available to us in terms of economic productivity. Well, to start the conversation off with, I'd like to start off with yourself, Sarah, uh, knowing and aware of your background as someone who works within the recruitment space, looking for vibrant and very diverse talent. I think it's only fair for us to reflect uh, on this International Women's Day on what the last two years uh, in light of the pandemic has really uh, taught us in terms of uh, the change in dynamics regarding human capital, but most importantly, productive human capital and how it is that many individuals have had to be nimble, to be agile in order to respond to the changing times. Are there particular learnings and outcomes that you've experienced as someone who works within the talent management and recruitment space? Yes, so one of the biggest um, learnings we had, particularly in the, in the 2020 part of the pandemic, was that the pressure on women from working at home was immense. And as a business, we didn't fully understand what working from home and not having access to adequate childcare and kids staying home from schools, what that would do to the levels of burnout that women particularly were experiencing. And what we saw among the women at Skynamo that we didn't see quite as much among the men was how much pressure they were under. And um, I don't feel that as a business, and I didn't personally, I didn't respond fast enough. I don't think we responded fast enough to support. And there was it put way too much pressure on people. And I think um, this, this merging, this merging of the home space and the workspace has um, required us to put up such clear boundaries. And I'm not sure that many of us um, had the tools to do that. So yeah, those are some of the lessons. Um, I think we're still learning them as yeah. well. I mean, I wish we could say like, oh, we got it, but um, we don't quite. You're right. And I think so pertinent that you mentioned that because we remain within a learning culture and, of course, being aware that we do need to respond uh, to the current pandemic that we remain under and, of course, ongoing external forces. I'll come back to some of the themes you mentioned earlier about how women have been impacted, how that might also impact on their productivity and even futures, uh, future ideals regarding uh, innovation, particularly when it comes to women within the workforce. But, Nyari, I'd also like to come to you here. You, as the leader of uh, uh, We Think Code, clearly is someone who is is highly invested in technology. You yourself are at the forefront on making sure that women actively participate in technology adoption. And I'm keen to understand that this must have been 
uh, an exciting time for you over the last two years where everyone who is anyone has had the opportunity to uh, dive deeper into uh, being more digitally aware and digitally conscious of their participation. Uh, what are your views and I guess your experience from a personal and professional point of view uh, regarding the lessons and insights that the pandemic has taught us about uh, the viability of the workplace? Well, it's, uh, thank you so much for that intro. And I mean, it, it is definitely exciting times in technology because we, we step up and suddenly the things we're trying to encourage people to adopt overnight are forced, you know, the ideas of remote work, the idea of using digital tooling, etc. But I work particularly with youth and our goal, like you mentioned, is to drive um, access and inclusion of young people, young women in particular, young women coming from low income backgrounds into technology and train them. And I think what we observed is that at the same time that a lot of opportunity arose, a lot of what exists as crisis in our society came to bear. And so our students usually would come on campus and they would train on campus. And so like everybody else, they are moved out into working remotely. As a tech enabled academy, you know, the, the, the easy part was the technology where some people might have been grappling with, you know, what are all these video conferencing tools? How do you use this computer this way and the other? Our students were ready for that. But what we realized is that technology can't live in a vacuum and the environmental factors came up. So we provided our students with the computers, with access to the data, but we found with the students from low income backgrounds that actually the environment they're in is not necessarily conducive for learning and or remote work. So is the electricity supply stable? Even if someone offers to pay for your data, do you have access you know, to good bandwidth in the area where you're in? If we get you the computer, we get you the electricity, we get you the data, is there a quiet room that you can go into and sit and apply your mind um, and not be dealing with everything going on outside? And that wasn't always true. And then the other thing that I think we maybe underestimate when we had it um, before COVID and came and disrupted all our lives was this issue of community and that in learning access to like-minded people, people motivated and interested in the things you're pushing for is a critical part of how we learn and how we strive as humans. So we caught ourselves, we found ourselves caught as technologists excited that everyone is now you know coming into our world work opportunities that would have been too far for our students and our graduates to access suddenly there's an opportunity because of remote work but we realize that within training the transition from that low income low capacity context into one you know where the digital age has taken over is a, a much more complex issue structurally and we've got to walk that road carefully and ensure that as we march into this new normal this world where you can work from anywhere we don't leave behind those that hadn't been fully capacitated before covid even hit and make the problem worse in Truth, we're still grappling with that, but I think um, this particular context has pushed these difficult conversations to the forefront in a way that I'm encouraged by. Yeah. I like some of those themes that you've mentioned, and I certainly want us to come back to them too, to look at best policy solutions or best practice uh, that we can learn from and perhaps implement. Uh, and of course, also keeping an open mind that uh, some solutions that might have been implemented on the ground already may need to continue to evolve in order to make sure that we not only capacitate, but allow for further individuals to be included uh, within this digital drive and this digital transition as the workplace itself and workforce uh, is certainly something that will be redefined. Ibad, I'd like to come to you because you also work in a very interesting sector. You're an investor, you are someone who's actively out on the ground supporting many entrepreneurs and running an organization of your own. Uh, and I can imagine in a very professionalized system and structure, uh, such as your own business, uh, perhaps you have some lessons and nuances that you can share with us as to how it is um, that this has shifted your thinking and altered the understanding of how it is that you can optimize productivity specifically when it comes to your workforce, which can literally be located quite anywhere. Oh, Ibada, we've uh, ch got a challenge there slightly. We're still stuck in 2020 where your mic is on mute. So I think just when we're <laughs> having a conversation about the evolution yeah, of the I'd workforce. I've actually, exactly. actually never used Zoom until COVID, and I don't think I'm the only one, right, all together. True. <laughs> but yes, thank you for that. Um, I think if you just generally gener look at it, um, I call it the big picture thinking. Um, when people are more relaxed, when people are... Um, are able to make, you know, there's that, that, that cocoon, as I used to call it, of, 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 of corporate banishment.
meant where you have to follow certain rules, take breaks at a certain time. Uh, we've moved on from that and people have become more productive in the way they think. They're able to innovate. Uh, they're able to work while on vacation. They're able to uh, 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 breastfeed while working. I think just generally people have become more productive as human beings. There's that pressure of having to, lunch break is at this time or, or, uh, leave is on this day, you have to pre-apply for it. All that has changed. And I would say that COVID is perhaps one of the best things that ha ever happened to humanity. You know, it gave us a wake up call that we have to change the way we were doing things and companies are now much more ready for any other pandemic or natural disaster that could occur. So preparedness, continuity, and this company shift in budgets, shift in in in, in, in human resource policies altogether. Um, and, and generally, it has, it, has, it has made us better people, you know, whether as employees or employers. Quite right. It has made us better people, more nimble in our thinking as well as our approach to work. I'd like to d dive deeper slightly in terms of your experience there, but and perhaps uh, capitalizing on the fact that you work and come from an investment uh, background, treasury as well as banking. Uh, and this is where we typically deal not only with spreadsheets, but of course tangible assets. One thinks about an audit. One thinks about going to uh, review and engage with uh, a company that you're keen to invest in. Uh, it's usually face to face. It's monitoring and of course engaging with the kind of asset that you might uh, likely seek to support uh, and I'm keen to understand how that perhaps has shifted the thinking in terms of uh, viable opportunities that you undertake in your work but also still adapting to the flexibility of uh, conducting your work almost anywhere so essentially that balance between physical interaction to assist you in making key financial decisions but at the same time leveraging technology as a key enabler to access more of these opportunities because uh, of its flexibility I mean, flexibility, you see, this is, this is just generally how things are, right? So we were used to one set of doing, one, one way of doing things. And we were all convinced that this is the only way that we could do it. Whether it is physical presence or virtual presence, it really doesn't change much, right? I'm still able to assess that business. I'm still able to review. The truth is the physical part of it, yes, we could do the analysis on that end, but not much has changed, not much has changed. And it, it sort of like makes us understand that we could do things virtually, talk to people virtually, uh, analyze some of these documents virtually, whether it's a financial statement, whether it's, you know, it's, it's a business plan, whatever it is, because it did really happen that it's similar way, you know, before COVID hit. So it's, 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 I would say it's an illusion. It's an illusion that we had created and adapted to. Um, in, in, in my line of business, if you look at it from an investment perspective, some of the African unicorns continue to grow stronger and bigger. You know, the logistics industry, those that, that are in the logistics industry, food delivery, um, healthcare altogether. And I don't want to go into specific names because there's multiple of them. And 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 it's for, for us as investors, I think this has been, I would say, uh, difficult in physical movement, but great in terms of uh, looking at some of those portfolios and investing. Definitely. You know, it has significantly improved improved um, some sectors here in Africa. It has improved sectors run by women as well, and it has improved the appetite for investors altogether. Yeah. So we did see businesses, you know, lose uh, uh, some profit or some sort of income, but there's been continuity, there's been some sort of adaptability towards it, uh, but generally it has been a win for this continent. Definitely. And that's something that's refreshing to hear because it does speak to increased deal flow, increased investment opportunities, as long as we're able to adapt and I guess uh, uh, fail forward in terms of some of the opportunities that do exist here. Tanim, I'd like to come to you here because you also have a very interesting background in terms of the business that you established, uh, really driving uh, an online marketplace in a country like Sudan and of course pursuing opportunities that quite literally speak to the flexibility of uh, using technology to allow individuals to, to, to leverage uh, off of being economically productive despite and regardless of where it is that they might be located. From your experience and looking at your organizational structure and of course uh, how it is that your workforce has responded to the challenges of the pandemic, how have things evolved and shifted for you in the last two years and are there key lessons uh, that you can share with us here this afternoon? Hi everyone. Um, so look, I, actually I think it's very interesting because when I look back at it, I think in many ways, we, we overestimated the capacity of our societies and societies that we operate in um, to really adapt to the pandemic. So let me explain that in terms of, 
you know, we had always, running an online marketplace, we always realized that the potential for people to set up small businesses and to work from flexibly from anywhere, um, you know, that, that is a huge potential there and that you can tap into that very easily and empower people very quickly. It worked very well for the marketplace. Um, we saw actually on, a, on a, for the business perspective, off, during COVID, we saw a huge increase in people using the platform to sell. We actually then saw a decline in users post-COVID as people went back into the physical marketplace. And I think actually then we have now settled on this kind of hybrid where people use a bit of both. So it just goes to show it's still not all about all online um, in these countries that we're operating in. There are other reasons as well. I think there are still limitations in kind of the payments um, and in delivery solutions we're also trying to, to deliver to solve those problems. But nonetheless, that is a reality that we have to face, that the societies we operate in are not quite ready to embrace pure digital. Mm. From the perspective of our own workplace, actually, was very interesting. It was like a social experiment because in many ways, when we started just working from home during COVID, one of the things is it gave us confidence as management to say, actually, then we can recruit from anywhere in the world um, and we can get the best talent from anywhere in Africa or elsewhere. That worked out really well. However, we started over time seeing more issues, which are similar to the ones that Niari raised, which is basically, you know, you can tell people to work from home, but are they, what is the context to that home? You know, do they, first of all, it's very tangible issues like electricity, physical space to work in. But then we started running into the cultural issues, right? Well, if you're a woman from home, you're expected to look after your kids more. You're expected to get meals for other people. You're expected to look after older parents. We also found this was also the same burden fell on the men in our business as well. It wasn't just the women, although the women definitely carried far more of it. And so, you know, the, the mental space to work just wasn't available in the same way. So we would have people working at like 5 a.m. or midnight because that was the only mm. time that they could find to work. And to me, that is not healthy at all. So that was a problem. Yeah. The other thing we found is, and this is, I think, the biggest reason why we actually made the decision to bring people back into the office. There is a sense of community that you build when you work together, especially if you've got a good work culture, which I think we really do have in our offices. When you have a good work culture, when women come into there, especially if they are not as blessed with coming from a wealthier background or a family that is more supportive or more encouraging, you can give them that space in the office and really build their confidence. So for me, actually not having some people in the office, especially juniors, especially women, I felt was hindering their growth because yeah. it is much more nerve wracking if you don't come from the right background to voice up over Zoom or to send an email or to speak up on a chat as it is to be in the office and inter interact with people face to face. Yeah. So we made the decision ultimately to try and be back in the office as much as possible. But of course, there are huge amounts of benefits to being more flexible. And I think this is the biggest takeaway from COVID is be flexible. Mm. Significant outcomes that you've highlighted there, Tani. I mean, I do want us to get back into them in just a moment, but perhaps, Sarah, this is where you can also share your voice uh, and expand on this and perhaps uh, 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 also add some of your thoughts, primarily when it does come to the additional support, especially when it comes to talent recruitment and talent management, uh, onboarding and providing the necessary systems and structure. So you can have the laptop, you can have the electricity, you can have access to the Wi-Fi, you could even have the high back chair, right? to help you with your posture but ultimately it speaks to what it is that businesses are doing to make sure that they inculcate a culture of support not only for their current employees but new individuals that they're looking to onboard and I guess creating that ecosystem and culture I'm keen to hear from you Sarah firstly as to what le lessons or learnings there or outcomes there are there and I guess Ibada perhaps you can also come in just to share some of your thoughts as to how you've implemented this in a practical uh, manner uh, for your colleagues or your peers and uh, industry participants but Sarah let's start with you mm, so we had some people who onboarded fully remotely while we um, were in the early stages of lockdown and it was extremely difficult uh, we managed but it required a lot more attention so what we learned is that onboarding and community building which I loved what we were talking about earlier community is so critical and the we're not finding easy ways to build community in a remote setup. So um, it takes a lot more consciousness, it takes a lot more communication, and it takes a lot more time. So the investment in building a sense of belonging community and it, when people are fully remote, mm. um, you need to do it because otherwise there is no productivity because people feel disconnected and things take too long. Um, I don't think we understand 
the levels of anxiety that feeling disconnected from your work produces. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something we'll only start realizing much later. The, the great resignation, which I think we're hopefully all experiencing and not just us, yeah. um, is, is, I believe, driven from the fact that our bonds of connection and community and belonging have been fractured and broken to the point where we are looking for it. We're seeking belonging. And I think most of us and most of the people that I speak to in our exit interviews, there's a sense that it could be better somewhere else. And um, and I think we are as a as a as a as workplaces really having to find ways to repair the 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 bonds that were broken. So the way we deal with it now is we deal with it by bringing people into the office. To be honest, so if people are remote, we bring them in for two weeks, and we have intensive um, intensive conversations and lots of together time to try and build a sense of community so that when they go back out, they've got the relationships they need to get the data and the information and to find the speed of productivity. Yeah. So that's, that's what we're doing here. Definitely. Very interesting. And I think that the more things change, the more they stay the same, as you say, allowing people to actually engage and physically interact before then uh, leveraging off of technology, establishing the relationship first. And Ibada, I, I wanted to come to you to understand how perhaps you have uh, practically implemented this in your, in your organization and workforce, maintaining the kind of relationships that are required in order to make sure that staff are productive. There was a period where we had to let everybody work from home, and, and this is across the different institutions or companies that we're involved in. Uh, but we did create um, the support groups, and we did create um, uh, this brainstorming um, groups where people were able to contribute and, and just give their take, and, uh, uh, and, and largely on innovation as well. So I think that we have found a better way uh, to make people more productive, a better way to... Uh, you know, give people the ability to make decisions uh, in their own private homes and also on how to best plan their time. And I found that employees have become more productive, more productive than they were in the office altogether. Uh, it, 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 and, and I think it is just understanding that um, people need to be given the freedom uh, to plan. People need to be given the freedom and the trust, most importantly. I think that's the word trust. Uh, that they're capable without you hanging over their head, uh, without you having to, uh, you know, look at, you know, what's what's in H the HR manual or what it, whatever it is that they signed. Um, and and people have employees have become much more productive and it helped increase output and profitability as well. Mm. Nyari, this makes me want to come to you because I'm hearing interesting themes that I'd like to interlink uh, and bring forth to you as the tech junkie here, if I may use that phrase. But as you say, you're someone who has to equip individuals with the right technical skills, um, you know, understanding the platforms to use, how they use technology to leverage their businesses. But in an earlier conversation, and what we've been hearing from the first two panels, is the fact that our most important resource in any organization is not the money, it's not the technology, it's not the building that we're actually meeting at, but it's our people. And I'm keen to understand how through We Think Code, you're actually inculcating a culture of empathy, empathetic leadership, uh, and perhaps humanizing the experience and interactions we have with technology. And that uh, helping us understand how at the same time, whilst technology allows us to be online all the time, that we also ingrain, I guess, an understanding of how it is to understand that at the end of the day, we are human beings interacting with each other, which calls for boundaries to be created, as we heard from our previous speaker, Tanim, uh, and of course, structure as well and support to continue to be provided for players in the workforce. So help us unpack how you participate in actively uh, looking to merge, being a technologist, but still uh, humanizing the experience of our interaction with technology. I mean, I think it might be career limiting for a technologist to admit <laughs> that sometimes there's too much hype around um, the centricity of technology. Essentially, tech solves people's problems when we use it properly. It also creates people's problems. But at least the way we try to use it is that it solves problems. So if you think of some of the big innovations that you know we enjoy, things like uh, video streaming. People have been needing entertainment for many, many, many years. What um, video streaming ultimately does is it introduces a certain flexibility and choice to how you enjoy that entertainment. I remember when I was a little girl growing up, if there was a show that you wanted to watch at 6 p.m., you had to be 
in the chair with the TV on at 6 p.m. And that's the only way you could enjoy it. What this now allows you to do is not only do you not have to watch it at 6 p.m. On a single platform, you have all of these options. And so tech works well, actually, when the empathy for the person we make decisions when we center the use of technology around enabling be it creativity be it convenience be it speed and so i, I genuinely do believe that what we're busy with in technology is solving human problems and this is why the idea of inclusion and especially the inclusion of women at the center of creating tech solutions is so important because you know, already on this panel, we've talked a little bit about the disproportionate burden that women will, you know, carry in childcare or elder care, the disproportionate responsibility that women will carry, you know, in working in the workplace. The answer then isn't necessarily that remote work is the new mandatory, because we might actually be hurting where we're trying to help. But maybe the answer is that a meeting that had to happen at 8 a.m. in the office can be a remote meeting. And then later on, when the kids are in school, someone can then get into a vehicle and be at the office for a meeting that requires that interaction and collaboration of people around the table. And instead of being stuck in traffic for an hour, getting home frustrated, needing to feed everybody and clean up mm. after, we, we change the time. So in my view, the empathy in technology comes from including a broad set of perspectives at tables where tech is created. Yes. And that's the work that we try to do, is to ensure that as we train young technologists, are young women represented? But not just young women from the city, are young women from the village represented? Mm. And not just young women from the village, young women who might be sporty, young women who might be introverted, extroverted. All of these layers of diversity, even within that women banner, are important because we make better solutions and we solve for other people when the people who we are solving for have a right to speak at the table. But yeah, and so at the center of technology has always been humans, will always be humans. Even AI is largely about humans not wanting to be busy with things that are, so, you know, a computer can solve and crunch quicker. True. Um, it's not to annihilate us, it's to enable us. Exactly. I'm I, I, excited by the themes that you've mentioned there because they really do set the tone and the theme as to uh, how it is that we move forward. And as has been highlighted by some of our earlier speakers today, we are still transitioning. We are still evolving. And I guess, Tanim, I'd like to come to you here to get some of your thoughts and insight uh, as a business leader, as someone who has work ex worked extensively in uh, some of the most difficult environments across the continent. Whether you look at reports from the World Bank, the African uh, uh, Development Bank, or even uh, the ILO, it's quite clear that between 70 to 80 percent of uh, the female workforce in the African continent is within the informal sector. And all of us that are gathered here today around the table have the ability to connect, to work with informal sectors, to have data, to have Wi-Fi and even access to power. I I'm keen to get your thoughts, Tanim, as a business leader as to how it is that we, in this new world of redefining the workplace, that we incorporate um, the participation of women within the informal sector, whether it's through leveraging technology, through building these relationships and communities that are required, but I guess how it is that we include them in these conversations of uh, reworking the workforce and the workspace? Look, I think these are really interesting questions. They're actually some of the exact questions that we're trying to tackle here. I mean, you know, the, the building of the online classifieds, uh, a lot of that is targeted towards um, women in small and medium sized enterprises who, for example, need, who want to work from home, who don't have, you know, the funds to do expensive advertising, um, who want to market in a safer fashion. Um, but actually, the, the stuff that we're really pushing ahead on now on the payment side is very much targeted at this, right? And it's mm. enabling really, I mean, one of the things that's very interesting is that we have seen incredible adoption, including by women in Africa, of mobile phones, right? And so that has automatically plugged them into technology. Now, I think the thing is, is that people have a mobile phone, but they don't use it um, as much as they can. Mm. I see, i.e. they don't get as much benefit out of it. It doesn't empower them as much as it should, as it would an equivalent woman in the West, for example. And I think what we really need to work on as solutions is adding on the software, um, mostly software, that will really enable that mobile phone to become an empowerment tool in the hands of women across the continent. Um, this is one of the things we're totally focused on. And I think if you, if you look at it from that perspective, if you empower a woman through a mobile phone, for example, to trade, 
which is what we do, but also to accept payments, to, to be a hub for bill payments. Um, you know, and I mean, there are a million other th technology s solutions that you can throw on there. You automatically, one, start empowering her because you give a, 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 an independent source of income, okay? Two, you enable to her to work very flexibly from wherever she is, be it the village, be it the city, be it whatever. And it's on her phone, so she controls it. And I think this is so very important. You know, I think that the thing with the shop or big something big is that someone can come and take it from you. When it's your phone, you know, you can slip it into your pocket and walk out the door. And I think I think this is really an opportunity here. Um, but we have to, as Nira says, we have to build for these customers. We can't take solutions that exist in the West and just assume they're going to work um, for our African women. We really have to customize them for them. Certainly. I think really uh, redefining what uh, a hybrid workforce and workplace actually means then within the African context, not just home or the office, it really is quite anywhere, but of course does speak to the kind of systems, solutions and communities that we're able to build. And even more so when it comes to the participation of women within the economy, given the additional responsibilities that we so often are not remunerated for, uh, but of course trying to make sure that we incorporate those to allow for increased capacity, capability and of course productivity. And overall wellness, as has been discussed in this conversation today. So a big thank you to each of my guests for joining us today. Nyari Samushonga, who is the CEO of We Think Code. Ibada Ahmed, who is the director of Iron Capital. Sarah Rice, the chief people officer at Skynamo. And Tanim Saheed, CEO and co-founder of Aslog.com, joining us today. We really appreciate your time, ladies, and wish you nothing but further success in all your uh, ventures. <laughs>